this series got questions in the second installment. Last week, we kicked it off, and we introduced this first question uh, that Jesus asked. He said, do you understand what I've done for you? And in the context there, he, he had just finished washing the disciples' feet. And he was a model, an, exam, an example of a heart of a servant. That was the title of the, the, the sermon, actually, a heart of a servant that Jesus got up from that supper table when all the other disciples passed that basin and didn't, didn't take the opportunity to be a, have the heart of a servant and wash each other's feet, which was common in the day. Jesus got up, took the towel and, and the basin and was an example. And one of the things we said yesterday is that, that in, in the middle of it all, like the disciples are like power grabbing and Paula, Paula ticking. Last week we said Jesus wasn't giving out titles, he's giving out towels. And so what he wants us to have is a heart of a servant. And that's what, and, and that question, the way we answer that question determines a blessing. He said, blessed are you, not of you that just know it, but you're blessed if you do it, if you practice this lifestyle of servanthood. Uh, a foot washing spirit is what we call it. Just thinking of others above and before yourself. So today we're going to dive into another question that Jesus asked, and this comes out of Matthew chapter 16. Check it out with me, you guys, in your notes or up here on the screen. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And so there was a lot of confusion of who Jesus was at this time. I mean, even in this time of history, there was like constantly different revolts that were rising up, different teachers or rabbis, or even, even people that were wanting to lead a revolt. And so like, okay, who's this next one? Who's the next guy trying to overthrow the Roman government? Jesus wants to know who do men, and there was a lot of confusion about who Jesus was. How many of you know that there's still a lot of confusion about who, who Jesus is today? There's a lot of like surveys that are always done like every year and updated. And there is so much diversity of people of what they say when they're asked about Jesus. Who do you say? And I think honestly today, there's probably more confusion, distortion today about Jesus than there was when his name wasn't even that common. And I think it's because of that. I think it's because his name is so common that we all have our misperceptions and what we think about Jesus or what we think he should be so Jesus asked the question, oh, well, who do people say I am? And here's the, here's the confusion. Check it out. They replied that some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, like one of the prophets, and others, Jeremiah, another one of the prophets. Just some weird theology about Jesus that they had. But then he kind of turns around on them all, and he says, but what about you? He asks, who do you say I am? And that's what we're going to look at today. That question, who do you say I am? I think they had some barriers and some challenges to, um, to really that question in Jesus' time. But in, in our time, because of the commonality of his name and maybe the representatives of Jesus or what we've been taught about Jesus, I think that this is a very important question. And although we might not have the same barriers as they did when Jesus asked them this question, I'd like to address some of the barriers that we have, even in our church culture. Whether you're a believer or maybe you're this is the first time at church, you've probably heard the name Jesus. But I think even in church culture, how we answer this question is so important. Here, feel this next feeling, you guys, because how we define God impacts our relationship with God. How we define God impacts our relationship with God. Now, I want to submit to you today that, that we have, again, even in our church culture, overly simplistic definitions of who Jesus is. And because our overly simplistic, sometimes just misinterpreted definitions or titles of who Jesus is, it's impacting our relationship with God. So let me give you a few of those, how today I think we kind of are missing it when we're trying to define who God is. Because we say, here's the first one, we say that God is good. And how many of you know that God is good? Come on, has God been good to you, church? God is good. He is he's absolutely good. Um, our faith can only go as far as our awareness of God's goodness is. Whatever your awareness of God's goodness is, that's where your faith ends. Okay, you cannot over-exaggerate the goodness of God. He is that good. We even had this saying way back in the day in church. We would say, God is good. And all the time. Right, no, we don't ever do that. I know it's weird. I'm sorry. 
I just wanted to show you guys. It's just we did that back in the day, <laughs> underscored the importance of or, or this character, or characteristic of the goodness of God. God is, he's good. He's all the time good. Psalm 119 says this in verse 68. You are good, God, and what you do is good. Like, it's always good. I might not always understand it, but God, your character is good, and you are always good, so teach me your decrees. Like, he's good. Even Romans in the New Testament goes as far to say that he's working out all things together for good, for those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. Now, he didn't say that all things will be good. All things will, will always be good in your life. One of the questions that we answer that you guys posed last week in this series of got questions, we're kind of allowing you to write some questions into the pastors and leaders, and we're taking some time to answer some of the most asked or the top asked questions. And we did it last week, and the, and the top asked question that you guys have is a common one, one that, one that I think in our culture society is a, a, a very much asked question, one of, the, one of the top asked questions. That is, why do bad things happen to good people. And so even that question in and of itself, it's like, I think it's, an, it's again, an inaccurate definition of the goodness of God. Could it be that God never changes? He is good. It's just our definition of his goodness that needs to change. I think, I think we're just, we're misdefining the character and the goodness of God because, because if he's, oh, he's good and he's always good and he always causes good in my life because that's who God is. Well, when things aren't going good, and I don't perceive good, and it's absolutely not good in my life, then my very definition of God causes my faith to fail me. Are you seeing this, you guys, with me? Okay, how we, how we define God, it impacts, it influences our relationship with God. And I think it's our, it's our finite, worldly, humanistic mind definition of God's goodness that is getting us sometimes into trouble, that causes us to be in and out, hot and cold, and sometimes even doubt. Our definition of the goodness of God and his character trait of goodness, that's what needs to change. Like our definition of, of good. For instance, how many of y'all like the dentist? Raise your hand. You weirdo. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I'm kidding. Like, I like the dentist. No, those are type A people. Because you know what? They're going, they're going, yeah, I like the dentist because I'm logical. I like be, having clean teeth. I don't like cavities. I, I get it. Most everybody, though, don't like the dentist because the dentist means shots and and i don't feel good and extractions and and root canals and all that stuff if you've ever had a shot by the dentist in your mouth or an extraction or drilling or anything like that happen can i ask you a question was that good you know was that was that a good experience <laughs> how about this was that dentist good oh <laughs> see i think it's our definition of good that needs to change, that's what's getting us into trouble and causing us to doubt. God is good, he is always good, it is actually our finite, incorrect, oftentimes, definition of the goodness of God that's actually getting us into trouble. How you define God, it determines, it influences your relationship with God. And if your relationship with God is dictated by how good your life is or isn't, then your relationship with God will always suffer and struggle. He's good. Here's, here's another title, I think, in our culture, in our society. He is, we say he's our provider, and he absolutely is our provider. How many of you guys recognize that God is the provider of everything in your life here? Come on. Everything, I don't know if you, if some of you may not know this, God is the provider of everything in your life. Nothing you have is yours. You are a steward of it all. You, you don't own anything. It's all God's. Even the Bible says your capacity to produce wealth comes from God. So, so your mental capacity, your problem-solving skills, your analytical skills, your, your critical skills, all that stuff, you didn't give it to yourself. That's a gift from God. Even the things that you may say, oh, I train myself. You know, I got a skill. I got a trade. God has given you the capacity to learn, to develop, to acquire the knowledge, to work that skill and craft or trade. Everything you have comes from God because he is a good provider. Jesus, uh, James chapter one actually says that every good and perfect gift comes down from our heavenly father. He, Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter six. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor weep, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then he says, are you not 
uh, worth much more than they. God is, he is a good, actually in the next chapter, Matthew chapter seven, it's not in your notes or anything, but that's where Jesus says, ask and it shall be given to you. Knock, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who, who asks, he says, shall receive. Everyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Okay, but here, this is where we can get in trouble. Our finite, incorrect definition of God as provider. Does that mean now then that I can name it and claim it and slap it in Jesus' name on it to seal it? Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Hey, if you can boss God around, then he's not God. You are. All right? I think, again, it's our, it's our incorrect, our finite definition of God's character that oftentimes gets, gets us into trouble. Because when God, when things don't happen the way that I think they should happen, and I made that prayer request, and it didn't come through the way I thought it would or thought it should, and the timing I, I thought it should, um, what's wrong, God? Weren't you supposed to be, weren't you supposed to provide? You see, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to allow, uh, you know, sacrifice my awareness and my knowledge of the goodness of God and, the, and God as my provider on the altar of human reasoning just, just for some meaningless explanation of why an error or why a prayer wasn't answered, okay? Uh, God is, he is good and he's our provider. And oftentimes we are praying for a better now we're asking God for a better now, and He's prepared a better place. See this? Some have you? What happens when when our relationship with God is dictated by the provisions of God? When God, when have you ever tried to say no to a bratty child? I think I think this is this I this like is such a great picture of of sometimes us who are crying to God for Him to provide for our needs. To do it when we want to do it or when we need it, we're asking for a better now, and God has prepared a better place. I mean, let's pr church, let's pray for heaven to invade earth. Jesus wants us to pray this way. Okay, Jesus said, hey, this is how you should pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, let heaven invade earth. Amen. But earth will never be heaven. It will never be heaven. You will never get all of your provision now, all the answers to your questions now. It's not there, it, and it never will be. Earth will never be heaven until Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem when he comes again. There will never be. But it's our incorrect, again, how we define God. It influences, it impacts our relationship with God. And these, sometimes these titles or these finite definitions we give him limit God. They box him, him. Who do you say Jesus is? This was important to Jesus, how, how people viewed him. It was important because he knew it determined the level of a relationship and influence he would have in their life. Who am I to you? Who am I to you? Here's another title. We, we say Jesus is God is Savior. Jesus is Savior. And absolutely he is. How many of you have been saved and set free by Jesus? Okay, He is Savior, and he's good. He's constantly saving, like he's continually saving me day by day. And for some of you, maybe he hasn't taken on that role in your life quite yet. And that's okay. Some of you are here and you're still investigating faith, investigating Jesus and church and all Bible and all that kind of stuff. And I'm glad you're here, man. I hope that this can be a place where you seek out truth and try to figure this whole faith thing out. But some of you, some of you have already received that. You know him as savior, but check it out. You haven't moved from there. Like that's, that's it. That's where your relationship with God began, and that's where it still is. And some of you have been in church for over a decade, and he's still at that level, at that finite definition that we have of him as Savior. Matthew chapter 14 tells the story of, of when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee, and that storm was beating it so bad, and they were afraid for their life. And Jesus comes walking on top of the storm on the waters, and and they think it's a ghost, but Peter kind of recognized him. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, command me to come to you on the water. I love Peter, what he does here, right? He doesn't, he doesn't just stay in the boat like the rest of the disciples and kind of wait it out. Who is he? He's like, if that's you, Jesus, I want to be where you are. Call me out. I want to be with you. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water. 
And he started coming, the Bible says, toward Jesus. When he saw the strength of the wind, though, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus was Savior. He reached out his hand and took a hold of Peter. You a little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? In the moments of distractions, in the moment of, of the storm, we forget who Jesus is, don't we? We forget that he's the one who called me out. Save me, save me. Some of us just keep him right there in that role. Every night, we pray our little bedtime prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I hope God saves me. Oh, God, save me. Every day is a similar, and if you forgot it one day, you come back the next, oh, God, save me. I hope you, hope you save me. And I applaud Peter here, though, because he jumped out of the boat. Half of us are still in the boat, getting the water splashed on our faces, going, oh, save me. Save me, God. And Jesus is actually calling you out of the boat. And if he stays, if he stays there as just that title in your life as Savior, and he doesn't become more. Listen, your life will become as stagnant as the water in your boat. So like we said, your, how you define God impacts your relationship with God. So I have a statement for you. I know, it, and, I, and I intentionally made it so corny so you'd remember it, okay? His title is vital, but giving him the right role is the goal. I know it's corny, all right, but you will, I hope is you will never forget this because I want you to see something different, how Peter answered this question, how we need to answer this question in order to get to the same place that Jesus was trying to lead Peter and his disciples. Okay, I want you to say it out loud with me. One, two, three. His title is vital, but giving him the right role is the goal. See, the roles that we give him, they don't, they don't affect or change him. But if you give him the right role um, in your life, it can absolutely change you. His role changes everything. Not the titles we give him, not the things that we say about him. And this is so important, especially in our, in our church culture, in the world. We throw out names and titles without the role. Let me say it this way. The power isn't in the title. The power is in the place he has in your life. Amen. That's the power. Who do you say I am. Let's see how Peter answers that in Matthew chapter 16, picking it back up. Peter answered, you are the what? Messiah. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now that word Messiah just means, that is Hebrew, the anointed one. In, in Greek, it's Christ. You see it show up in, in your New Testament. You thought Christ was his last name, didn't you, have you? Jesus Christ. No, that's his title. But his title is it just, it's just a... Without the role, it, it means nothing. And, for, and this, was, this was the right answer, though. And even Peter didn't have a full revelation of what that, what that title was. Messiah, son of the living God. Because, because he hadn't yet given revelation about what that title was. To them, the Messiah was Savior. And that's, that's what it stopped at. And, and, and for them, what they believed, that he was going to be the Savior of you know, their oppression from Rome. They didn't understand that he wasn't coming to establish a, a physical kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. It wasn't a political kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom. So they still have blinders on and couldn't really see the fullness of this role in their life that Jesus desired as Messiah so much more than just a savior. I'm gonna, and this is what I wanna, we're going to study. The three different titles that we get all you know, comfortable with, too comfortable with, and we really don't know the Messiah. Some, maybe, possibly, don't know, the Messiah, the son of the living God, of who he is and what that role means when he is that in our life. And this is so important. Jesus asked this question because he's trying to lead us somewhere. Look what he says. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, what? Blessed. blessed. Just like last week, Jesus asked a question to lead toward a blessing. How we answer this question determines... The, the how life-giving this relationship with God is going to be. What kind of flow and power is going to come from this relationship with God is, is determined by how we answer this question. Who do you say Jesus is? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You can't give this to yourself. You can't give this revelation. I can't give you this revelation. Only God, only the Spirit of God, through, the, through God the Father, can you actually even see the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and what real role he wants to play 
in your life. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I want you to see the impact of how you answer this question correctly. When, you, when Peter says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, he said, man, not only are you going to give you the blessing, but I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, son. Okay, now, because you see me correctly and you perceive me correctly, that, that determines what you receive from God. How you perceive God determines what you receive from God. Amen, somebody? And so Peter, is, he's getting a revelation. You're the Messiah. You're, you're the son of the living God. You're the anointed one. You're the Savior. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and check this level of authority out. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How many of you want that level of authority? Amen? Okay, if that's what you want, then check it out. Don't stop it, Savior. Because that level of authority, that, that level of revelation of who Jesus is in your life has to go beyond this surface level of Savior. And there's nothing wrong with knowing Jesus as Savior. And in fact, the opposite, man. God could do nothing else in our lives, and we would be eternally indebted and undeserving of the saving work of our souls. Amen? But it's not even us. Check it out. It's not even us who's asking more of God because he's done enough. It's God actually telling us, hey, there's more. Hey, there's, there's so much more that I want to do in your life. It didn't stop at Savior. It just started at Savior. And some of us, I think, have... have Put God in that box of just save me, save me. And every time you sink in life and every time it's not going or maybe even every day, save me, save me, save me. And he wants to be so much more. Who do you say Jesus is? Let me give you the three, um, three titles of Jesus and the roles that those titles should play in our life. It really is the, the fullness of that title, the Messiah, the Son of of the living God. Here it is. Write them down. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's another term that you're probably familiar with as it relates to Jesus. Some of you don't even come to church or don't even like church. You know that term. You know, you know it as it even relates to Jesus, the Lord Jesus or something like that. You get it. But this promised Messiah, Jesus, is more than a Savior. He is Lord. You may want to write this down. This is what it means. He's the ruler of the day to day. That's literally what it means. The Lord is, it would oversee a, a province, a city, a town. He is the ruler of the day today. Check it out. Not just a part of your day. He's not the ruler of a part of your week. What makes him Lord, if he's the ruler of your day by day, day to day, you're breathing, working, eating your day to day. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. We quote this verse very often every week here at Discovery, but if you de declare with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord. That's what he says. If you declare that Jesus is the ruler of the day-to-day, -day, I'm yours, God, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You're not saved by crying out, save me. You're saved when you give him the day-to-day. -day. That's, what, that's what makes you saved when you, when you surrender to the lordship of Jesus. And when Jesus is Lord, check it out. You no longer dictate your day today. He is the ruler of the day. And here's the beauty. His day to day will cause you to, will cause you to step out of the boat. His, his, his rulership over your day to day will, will move you from that ordinary stagnant boat life that we've been living. Is Jesus the ruler of your day to day? Is he the Messiah, the son of the living God? Is he Lord? Colossians 3, 17 puts it like this. Whatever you do in word or deed. Hey, whatever you do, whether it's the words that are coming out of your mouth, the words that you're speaking, or the actions that you're doing throughout the day, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Literally, literally what he's saying is that, that that is an expression of your worship that you do all things as unto God, as an expression of your worship, that he, that's what makes him Lord, when he's the ruler of your every day, of your day to day, whatever that is, in word or in deed. Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord. He's the ruler of the day to day, and that title may not mean much, but the role is his goal in your life. When you say he's your Lord, what you're saying is the day to day operations is yours, God. Amen? 
Here's the second title. As, as the Messiah, he wears this crown. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Jesus is the only king whose kingdom will never end. The Bible, some of the messianic prophecies says, he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus, the Messiah, is king. He's the prophesied king. And we imagine kings as powerful leaders, wise and just, with a bunch of wealth and riches and who have authority and influence. Yet of all the earthly kings that have ever existed in history, there is no king like King Jesus. No king. Our Messiah is different from any other king who ever lived. It's more than the day-to-day. -day. Check this out. What makes him king is that he's ruler of life. He's ruler of life. You see, great faith does not come from great effort. Great faith comes from a great surrender. It's, and I don't surrender just the day to day. I surrender my life, my future, my destiny, my goals, my purpose is yours. All I am, my life is yours, King Jesus. Now, as a king, he has much greater authority than just a Lord. And see, there is levels to our relationship with Jesus, levels to the nature of influence that we're allowing him to have in our lives. I wonder what level you're at. <laughs> I wonder if, like, maybe you're moving beyond just the pro provider and savior, maybe even moving beyond that Lord level. That's awesome. But when you're ready to move beyond the day-to-day -day operations of the Lordship of Jesus, then you can get to the macro level of the majesty of Jesus, of King Jesus. Revelation 19, 16 says this, that on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. And here's his name, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You see, he's greater than a Lord. He's the Lord of Lords. He's greater than a King. He's the King of Kings. He has the power to give life and take it away. Now, consider this. When you pledge your day to day to the Lordship of Jesus, he causes your days to flourish. What happens when you surrender your life, when you pledge your life to a king? And not just any king, a king who created you, a king who knows you, your dreams and your purpose and has the power to bring them to fruition. What happens when you pledge yourself and your life to that kind of king and you no longer consider your life your own? Colossians, or Galatians rather, chapter two actually tells us to do this. He says, I have been crucified with the Messiah. That's that word right there. I have been crucified with the Messiah, the Son of the living God, with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Some of you are missing out on the depth of a relationship with Jesus because, because you want to control your own lives. And so he's not moving from just the, the ruler of the day to day. He wants to be the ruler of your life. But in order to do that, we have to surrender our future, our ambition, our goals, our purpose, our gifts, our talents, our treasures, everything to the control of King Jesus. Peter responded, you're the Messiah. You're more than a savior. You're the Lord, the ruler of the day to day. You're, you're the king, the ruler of life, but of all the messianic probably prophecies, the, the biggest one that we have, the one that took probably the greatest revelation um, for them in their day to receive was this, that Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is God. You guys know this, the messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. If you've been around church around Christmas time, you probably heard it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he'll, he shall be called Emmanuel which means God with us. And here's the role. What does that mean? What does that title? What does that mean? The role that we need to submit to in our life is that he's the ruler of eternity. He is the ruler of eternity. He's the ruler of the day-to-day -day as Lord. He's the ruler of life as king. He's also the ruler of your eter eternity because he's your God, and that's what God does. John chapter 20, after Jesus' resurrection, we see him kind of, uh, giving last, last words and, and marching orders to the disciples over the course of a long period of time. Many days he was doing this. And, and on one occasion, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples 
when Jesus came. So he was actually, and Thomas gets a bad rap, but he wasn't, he wasn't there. Everyone else saw him, right? And they had, the, they had the benefit of seeing him. And Thomas gets a bad rap all because he wasn't in the room. You know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a teachable moment there that I just want to take, that just the, the, the power of being in the right place at the right time. You know, that, that, that some, some of us, are, we don't have the revelation, maybe the anointing, the grace, the thing we need, or whatever it is, because we weren't in the room when God was providing it. Ooh, that's a different teaching. Okay, I'm just going to, but that's, don't, don't, don't get on old bad doubting Thomas here. You just wasn't in the room, okay? So order disciple, the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I mean, you guys already saw it. I need to see it. It put my finger where the nails have been. It put my hand into his side. I will never, he says, believe. And then he got what he wanted. Eight days later, his disciples were once again inside with the doors locked. And Thomas this time was in the room. He was there. And Jesus came and says, and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here. Come on, look at my hands. Reach out, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe, Thomas. And Thomas replied, and he got this amazing revelation, my Lord and what? And my God. Not just my Lord, but my God, because Thomas realizes that for Jesus to be there in this moment, it went beyond being a Lord or a king. Only God has the power to conquer death. And I think that, that, that Jesus, listen, Jesus wants us to move beyond the surface level of his relationship in your life. And, and, and maybe, possibly, that our oversimplified, finite definitions of who he is is, is limiting the level of influence and authority he wants to give us. That he wants us to move beyond just Savior, and he, he wants to be so much more than that. Paul had a revelation of who God was and how highly exalted Jesus was. And this was his response in Philippians chapter 2. He says, for this reason also, God highly exalted this Jesus and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow of those, he said, who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, so when you look to your day-to-day, -day, even like today, right now, when you look to your day-to-day -day life, for some of you, you may say, it's kind of out of whack. It's chaotic. It's, it's all over the place. Well, look to... Look to who, who's the ruler of your day today. Who's the ruler of your day today? Or some of you look at your life and you think like, like it's aimless or directionless or maybe there's, it's lacking fulfillment or significance. And, and what you need to do is just look to who's the ruler. Who's the ruler of your life? Or maybe even your eternity. Some of you don't even like to think about your eternity. Or when you think about it, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, who's the ruler of your eternity? Here's, here's the question, one more time. This is Jesus would have us, he'd ask this question, who do you say Jesus is? And I think that this in our culture, in our day, today, in our society, is even more difficult for us to answer this correctly, for us to move beyond the perceptions and misperceptions that we have received or interpreted or seen from others about who Jesus is to who truly he wants to be, the role he wants to play in our life as Lord, as King, and as God. Come on, let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. And